Welcome to our August RV Repair Club live event. There's been a lot that's been going on since our live event last month. Uh, we had the Grand National Rally over in Four City for Winnebago and thousands of people coming in with motorhomes just completely taking over the entire countryside. Uh, last week or two weeks ago, I guess it was, Angie, we shot uh, some couple new classes. We shot air conditioning, a complete guide to everything to do with air conditioning, how it works, troubleshooting, maintenance. And then a new product, uh, solar. Uh, we had GoPower uh, sent us a, uh, I think it was a 110 watt panel, and we put that on a Winnebago Brave, and that was a pretty unique project. So uh, Sam tells me we got a ton of questions. I won't tell you exactly how she described them, just a lot. So let's get started with our first one here. I did uh, download a few of them. Uh, the first one comes from Marie, and she has a 1994 Bounder on a GM chassis, and it says that I have no tail light, lights um, or running lights, fuse blows, what might be a typical point to inspect. Typically on these older coaches, it's a ground wire because the running lights and the 12-volt lights are going to run off the chassis battery, so with Bounder in 94, they either put it up front uh, in the engine compartment somewhere, sometimes they had it on a frame rail off the side, I don't know what year they switched to the step wells underneath it, but you'll have it either either place, and it's the chassis battery. Um, don't get it confused with the house battery, but you have a, a positive and a negative um, wire that comes off of those, and a lot of times they would uh, take the tail lights or the running lights instead of running a dedicated line to a distribution center or um, the battery itself or the block, they would take the ground down onto the chassis, and then they would run the positive up to the fuse in the front. My guess, and, and they were gremlins, they were notorious for um, welds that would crack or stuff like that and, and not getting a good ground. So the first thing I would do is just take a new wire, uh, hook it to the ground of your chassis battery, and uh, go back to one of your lights and just see if your lights light up um, or running lights. I'm assuming it's somewhere way up towards the front. They're probably all ganged together. So uh, it might be that you have to run a new ground wire and, and you know basically trace where that's at. The problem you're going to have with the 94 is there was very little documentation done by most manufacturers. Uh, one of the, Winnebago had wiring diagrams available. Still have them. You can go online and get them. Your bounder probably does not. Um, you might be able to find a dealership that has a set of the old ones but Bounder is now owned, or Fleetwood is now owned by the Rev Group, REV, and so you might be able to go online and see if you can get a wiring diagram or a chassis diagram from them, but uh, that typically was installed by the RV manufacturer, so if you got a chassis diagram, it would show the fuse block, but it wouldn't show how those lights are typically on. So uh, it's, it's just digging in and finding, you know, is it, a, is it positive or is it negative? Uh, where is that short at? And you might have to run a whole new wire. So good, good luck with that. That's like we said, that's Gremlins. The next one comes from Edwin, and Edwin has a Jayco Melbourne, 2011. He said the generator runs, but dies out after a while. And this could be a couple different things. Um, one of the things it could be is low oil. It does have a uh, sensor for low, low oil pressure, and it will start for a little while, and then it will run out. <clears throat> Excuse me. More than likely, it's a varnished carburetor, and as it gets hotter, and it you know it just kind of swells up a little bit. Fuel doesn't get brought in there correctly, and uh, it, it will die. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a little tickle in my throat here tonight. Uh, that's very common with generators. Generators need to be started once a month and run under load, and that means getting them as close to 30 amps as you can. And that's, that's a challenge to do. You leave that sit in storage for three, four, or five months at a time, and that gasoline that's in there, it's being refined very cheaply. It will varnish, and it will create an issue in, in the carburetor of those and, and fuel system. And we end up having uh, either a no start or a run for a while and, and a low start condition. So I would, I would check that. Uh, probably need to take put a little stable in it. Um, it's more than likely a gen, um, an owning generator. Uh, you might be able to put some fuel cleaner like sea foam or something like that in too to help clean it up a little bit. 
but typically that's going to mean taking it somewhere and having that carburetor cleaned out really well. Uh, my folks had that same thing happen. They had a 2003 Winnebago Brave that they bought brand new, went to Alaska, um, and it wasn't six months, and their generator wouldn't start, all due to that condition. The next one, then, is Brian Cash. And Brian has a Winnebago, a 1998, it looks like, Vectra. And he had, I changed, oh, the house batteries will not charge when I have the shoreline power plugged into the RV. And I think with a, 90, a 98, there's two different types of uh, converters. And the way the system works, I have a sample of one here. This happens to be an all-in-one unit. And what you've got is you've got 120 volt comes in. For the air conditioner, the refrigerator, and one happens to have the converter right onto the side here. So there would be for that converter. Um, I'm not sure what year Winnebago went to the separate converters. It would have been close to that. So you may have a system that just has the circuit breakers, but it doesn't have the converter built into the side with these fuses. Um, that then would, you would have a separate converter. And typically the uh, Winnebago put those underneath the kitchen cabinet. So go in. Um, the, the easiest way to find out is if you plug the unit in, First of all, look to see if you have a circuit breaker because that converter is going to be supplied by a 120 volt power source from that distribution center and we'll have a circuit breaker. Uh, the next thing you need to do is plug it in, see if you can hear any kind of a fan um, starting to whirl a little bit. That converter should give off some type of a, a slight noise and usually they stuck them underneath the cabinets in the kitchen, like I said, pull the drawer out under there and just kind of start digging around. You should be able to find it. We just did a uh, 2002 Winnebago Adventurer, and it's got a very similar type of a setup, and they had a separate charger underneath the, uh, the countertop. Then, uh, basically what you need to do is see if that charger has a fuse on the charger itself, and then put a multimeter like this, just verify. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times I get a question that says, my, my batteries aren't charging. Well, are they, are they trying to charge and they're just not holding a charge? or is the converter actually not charging. So what you need to do is just take a multimeter like this, put it on the 12 volt DC setting, put this on your positive and your negative post on your battery, plug the unit in, and just see you should have 12.6 if the batteries kick in and go up to about 13.6 to 14.6. You may be getting a charge from your converter and, and, and that's a very common problem with, with batteries. Uh, if they're sulfated, they, they just take that 13.6. When you shut it off, they just drop down and they don't hold a charge. So make sure your batteries are in, in a good condition to start with. Check your converter to see if you're getting anything out of that. And one of the things you might have in the 98, it, it was an option. Um, it, it, not too many people got it, but you could get an inverter that uh, was large enough, like the Freedom 2000, there's Xantrex and several others, they would invert 12 volt to 120 for a variety of components inside the coach. They also were the converter or the battery charger in there. So check and see if you got one of those larger ones. There's a variety of different ways that they could have gone with that 98. Just see, number one, am I getting any charge out of that? Number two, are my batteries good? If I have no charge coming to that, then I probably have a bad converter. Okay. And the next one is it's very small here. Looks like Patrick. And Patrick has a 2018 Coachman Freelander. Nice little unit. Love those things. Um, I changed my original factory generator oil at 22 hours. How often in hours? and or months should you change on a continued basis? Thanks, Pat. There it is. Um, Onan has their recommendation for the different types of generators and all kind of boils down to how much you actually use it. Once a year is a really good idea just to change that, um, you know, and also exercise that generator. But uh, if you're using it a lot, they do have a scale in there and I believe 
Um, and, I, and I guess I would just be guessing. Look in your owner's manual. You should see a, a scale in there that tells you every so, so many months um, or so many hours on the generator. And I believe it's somewhere um, in about the 50 to 75 hour range. But um, again, check, check your owner's manual. Good thing you changed it after 22 because they do have break-in oil typically that you should change you know, a little earlier than the first recommendation. And then we have Danielle, and Danielle has a 2008 Damon Tuscany. Uh, looks like 40 SS or something, it's very small here. My slide out are working sporadically, my slide out. Um, what I need to have a little more information with that, when, what slide out, are you talking bedroom slide, are you talking galley, dinette slide, is it hydraulic, is it electric? Uh, usually with a sporadic, um, you know, the, the operation of it, the first thing I would check is, is, is make sure that your, uh, your coach is level and secure, get your leveling jacks down, get a good solid base on that frame, that way your sidewall is going to be nice and straight and, and solid so that you're, you're not trying to push a room in a crooked um, sidewall. I've seen this several times where the motor is just getting a little bit weak and when it tries to push that slide room out, it just doesn't have the startup power to do it and because it's pushing against a crooked side. That's the other thing to check too is your, your batteries. You know, typically those are gonna run on the engine battery and you might have a weak engine battery. Some of them run them off the, the house batteries, but normally you have to ch turn the key on, put the foot brake in, um, and, and turn the hydraulic jack on to, to get it to go. Now, if it's electric slide, the smaller ones, those will typically be on the house batteries. And again, check those, that battery level. Um, if it's not working, I would immediately go in and check the voltage at the battery probably somewhere down to 10.5 and then it's not going to work. Um, you know, so when you're plugged in sometimes and, and it seems to work when you're plugged in, that's because the converter's thrown out 13.6. Uh, otherwise you need to check at the motor itself to figure out what voltage is coming in and you know if it's, if it's not working coming out then you probably have something in that motor that you know it, it's just it's taking too much of an amp draw to start and get going and it just kind of so check your battery, I guess, would be the, the biggest thing I would check. Uh, we have Paul, and Paul has a Brookside 301 RBS 2007. And we're having a problem with our water heater. It won't work on electricity or propane. The igniter doesn't click like it's going to light. What should I look at to resolve this issue? So the first thing you need to look at is 12 volt power. Whether you're trying to work on electricity or LP with that, uh, that water heater, it needs 12 volt power coming into it to make the module board and all this other stuff work in there. So check 12 volt at the module board. Inside the module board, you should also have a fuse that's in there. Uh, you will have a fuse on the distribution panel, which we've talked about beforehand. So check power to that. So 12 volt power to begin with. Um, you know, that if you're not getting a click, it's not opening the gas valve, it's not trying to, if the gas valve doesn't open the spark igniter, it's not going to go. So um, that's, the first, that's the first thing you really need to verify. And this looks like Alejos Alan, Alana. And he has a trail light 2009. And the question is... The fridge just stopped working. Disconnect everything and hook it up direct to AC and still could not get nothing. Check all the fuses. Please give me any ideas. Thanks, Alex. Well, the first thing you need to do is understand the operation of it. It Does it work on LP? And I don't think he said, what did he say? The fridge stopped working and everything. Hook up direct AC and still not working. So check and see if it's working on the LP side. Your fridge should be a 120 volt or LP and it'll have an auto and an LP setting on it. If it works on the LP side then you have an electrical issue. You probably have the outlet that is out the back vent could be hooked to a GFCI so I would check 120 volt power to that outlet. 
Next thing I would do is take the module board off the back in the vent side. There's, there's an inline fuse for 120 and 12 volt um, in that. If it doesn't work on either or, um, you know, well, let me back up even a little more. So if you got 120, it works on LP, you've got 120 volts coming in, the, the uh, few inline fuse is good, then pretty much it has to be the electric heating element. Because the way that system works, if you're hooked to electricity, the thermostat inside says, I need cold. And, you know, if you've got nothing going on it, then, um, then it's, if it's trying to light, it's got a, a heating element that will heat the solution and make it go through the cooling, cooling unit. On LP, it's going to use a flame to do the same thing. So if, you're, if your LP side works fine, then it's saying, hey, the thermostat's working, the thermistor works, the eyebrow board's working, all that stuff is fine. you got to nail it down to that 120 volt coming to... Um, from the distribution center where you'll have a circuit breaker to the module board through that fuse and telling it to light. And the last one I have here is from Ann and she has a Keystone Cougar 2015 it looks like? 19, 2019. That's a new one. The shakedown crews on our brand new RV gave us a lot of problems with the AC not working. We had a 50 amp RV park site. We have one AC unit and one battery in the RV. The battery in the converter needed to be replaced. Would have having two batteries in the RV keep this problem from happening again? Not with the AC. Uh, the roof AC is only going to work off of uh, 120 volt power. So when you're plugged in at the campground, you've got plenty of, we got 120 volt power with a 50 amp service especially, um, you know, you should have two legs coming in there and that, that AC should work uh, without a problem and I don't know why it would have taken the converter out and the battery out of it. Now you do need some 12 volt power to that, um, you know, that front board that's going to make your air conditioning work. So you might have had a bad battery to start with and it was not giving enough power to that front converter board and telling it, hey, or not converter, a control board, and telling it we need to start, we need cold, and then so forth, just to start that, that motor up. We just did a complete class on, on that last week. Um, you know, and it, it's not uncommon for brand new units, especially if it's got one battery, to have a battery that's already sulfated. Even in 2019, it sits at the RV manufacturer until the dealer buys it, and then it sits at the dealer lot until you buy it. And the whole time, that battery is not being conditioned properly. So it's going to start to sulfate. Every time it drains down and they leave it in a uh, discharged condition, sulfur coats on the plates, and it just, it just keeps diminishing the amount of uh, storage capacity it has. So I, I would say, you know, Check to make sure that you, you charge that battery up properly. Uh, once a month it needs a multi-stage charge. And talk to your dealer about why it needed a new converter. That, that to me is awfully strange, but it should have all been under warranty. So hopefully it, hopefully it got it fixed, but I don't think two batteries is, is going to help you with that. Okay, now we'll go to Sam up in Minneapolis. He has a lot of questions for me. Michael asks, how will a sudden loss of tire pressure in one of the rear tires affect the drivability? Well, anytime you have, and it doesn't even have to be a blowout, it's just a sudden loss of, t of pressure where the valve stem or anything like that, what's going to happen is it's that as you're going down the road, you've got centrifugal forces, pull, or your, your force is pulling you towards the road. Whatever tire goes out, that friction is going to pull you towards that uh, blowout or that sudden loss of, of air. So um, what you're going to need to do, and everybody kind of panics and thinks they should slam on the brakes, the first thing you should do is actually floor the foot feet. And that sounds strange, but Michelin, Michelin has a great video um, called the, uh, it's a tire safety video. If you go to www.rvsafety.com, there is a whole section on tire safety and pressures, and, and the critical factor is the name of that video. And you can go on there and watch that. They actually blow a tire out and show what it does. So it's, it's going to pull you towards whatever tire is going out. So the thing you want to do is you want to, you want to floor it. And everybody goes, but I don't, I don't want to go faster. And this is in the video. I just took that line from there. But what, 
you think about it, when you're driving your truck and a trailer or your uh, motorhome, I don't know if he said what kind of vehicle it, it had, but um, when you when you hit that foot feed, it's not like you're going to just shoot out and squeal the tires. You've got a huge rig there, a lot of weight, and it's just going to it's going to slowly build momentum. So here's what happens: you have a blowout, and it's going towards this tire. If I put on the brakes, I'm going to go faster to that. It's going to actually throw me into the ditch faster. If I hit the foot feet, it's going to bring that momentum back because it's going to give me control and bring it back to the center, and then I can slowly ease off and get off to the side of the road. So watch that video. RVSafety.com is called The Critical Factor by Michelin. Great video to watch. Gary asked, with portable propane tanks, there is an expiration date for refilling. Is there any restrictions on onboard propane tanks in an RV? There is not. And the diff the, there's two different types of, of uh, storage containers, I guess we'll call them. And I have a tendency to call everything a tank. The portable are DOT cylinders. It's like what you would have for your grill for 20-pound tanks. Some of the larger fifth wheels have 40-pound tanks. Uh, they have a 10-year um, recertification process where when you take it in to, let's say, let's say K&H here locally, we did some videos with them. You might see them on uh, online. We do have some really good filling procedure videos. And what they do is they come in and recertify it. They look to make sure it's got the new OPD valve. They make sure that there's no rust, damage, anything like that. Then they'll restamp it, and it's good for another six years, I believe it is. And, and, and don't quote me on that. Um, we do have a good article in the, um, um, in the uh, website about uh, those tanks and, and or cylinders. Now, what he's talking about is the ASME tank and that is one that is on a motorhome and it's permanently mounted and that does not have a recertification. They are required to inspect it when they go in and just make sure that all the valves are good. There's no real, um, you know, what looks like rust that would be detrimental to safety. Peter asked, hi again, Dave. Hi again, Peter. I plan on spending six months at a Florida travel park with my A-class coachman coach. I plan on the slides being out for the full um, six months, probably full time. <laughs> for the full, yeah, this was they came separate. Oh. Okay, for the full time, as well as up on the leveling jacks. Okay. Is there anything I should be looking at, such as retracting, etc., while set up for such a long period of time? Thank you again. There, there's people do this all the time. Um, you know, a lot of people will go to a location and use it for a week, weekend, just leave it there constantly. If you're going in for six months time, the only thing I would suggest is, um, you know, take a little bit of the um, Th Thedford has protect all. They have a uh, slide lubrication and a slide uh, the gasket conditioner. It's called a protect all surface conditioner, and it has a UV protection. So just you know, depending on Florida, you're going to get a lot of sun, depending on what time of the day or, you know, what position you're at. I would say just once a month or so, hit those with that spray and just kind of clean them off. That'll keep your, um, the rubber gaskets nice and soft and conditioned and they won't crack. Um, they have a tendency when they're just sitting all the time exposed to the sun. You know, I would definitely cover your tires uh, for that long period of time. But as far as the slide room, um, you know, the only thing you you would have to do is, is uh, if you don't have a cover over the top of it, I would just occasionally kind of look up on top of those slide rooms just to see, you know, do I have any debris or stuff like that that's up there and that's going to start to decay. So, you know, you should be fine. Neil asked, what is the best power TV antenna for my RV? Well, there's, there's a variety of them out there. Um, I like the Wine Guard, but I'll, I, I know Winnebago's using King Controls and all their stuff. But we have done a, a lot of videos on the WineGuard product. It, 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 they have the Razor Air, so you can, if you have the old Batwing style, you can take that wing off and you can put a flat panel that will allow you to go both directions uh, with it. It gets about twice the distance in a signal. Um, you can also upgrade to the stationary model that just sits and you turn it. We do have a good video on putting that one on a fifth wheel. Um, it's kind of neat. We put it on this fifth wheel on the south end of town where there isn't a lot of good reception and she got about one or two channel two channels on a good day 
and we put that thing in and we got six different channels around so it was, it was pretty cool um, I didn't know we had six channels in this area but anyway um, and then they've got the automatic where you can just put it up and it will go find so if, if you're going to a lot of different places rather than channel search all the time and try to find where all the the towers are at um, you can put the automatic version on as well so I, I, I do like the wine guard um, you know they've been in business for a long time and they've got a great reputation Dennis asked my I think it auto corrected had leveling jack control board will light up when I take a left turn where the coach has to lean a little more than usual okay that's the question it might be hydraulic um, get I you know typically you got did say what year the coach was okay um, one of the things for those of you out there watching, it's really important that you, anytime you do any questions for service or anybody uh, out there, to make the model of the year of the rig so you kind of have an idea of narrowing it down at least a little bit to, was it hydraulic? You know, the older, older systems would have been HWH or power gear. Uh, there were some quickie that were out there for a while, and, and it depends on the size too. The smaller units can do electric ones. Uh, this sounds like more of a, of a uh, with the jack pad and stuff that, that it would be power gear uh, or Lippert is the new Lippert components uh, incorporated LCI they bought power gear but they have a lot of their own stuff as well but typically if it does that uh, from what I've seen is that you're starting to get a seal that is um, it, it's, it's getting weak and it's not holding the jack up and so when you lean a little bit sometimes that jack goes just enough so it it kind of goes past the down sensor and, I, and I'm assuming that if the lights I'm not sure did he say all the lights or a certain light or he said leveling jack control board will light up when I take a left turn okay so then that, that I mean it could be one of the sensors for the jacks but if it's the whole board that's lighting up then you somewhere you, you have a wire in there that's just the connection starting to go out and and for whatever reason when you turn it's it's putting some kind of a stress on either the connector or the wire um, or a relay even sometimes in those but um, you know if, if you're getting it just on a left turn it sounds like a weight type of issue so Michael asks, low water pressure while hooked up to city water starts good, then in seconds slows down to three minutes a gallon. Can hear hissing outside at intake to RV. Can jiggle hose, gets better, but does not last. Any idea what's wrong? Read that again for me. Um, low water pressure while hooked up to city water okay. starts good, then in seconds slows down to three minute slash gallon can hear hissing outside at intake to RV can jiggle hose gets better but does not last any idea what's wrong hmm well I guess my first question is the, if, if it's hissing at the intake is that at the intake of the city water fill you know because you get you get two basic ways the the water system works in your your rig. First of all, you start and you hook a hose up to the outside. And I guess the first thing I would do is I would check your water pressure at the actual campground source. Now you can get a variety of different gauges uh, that al allow you to just hook up and show you what that pressure is, and 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 have it on there while it's running. You know, just see does because a lot of places I know will start off with good pressure because they got all the stuff built up and you'd open the valve and it's like oh, and then you got all these other people that are using the system and then it goes down you know three gallons per minute is actually not too bad um, you know the typical water system is going to have 40 pounds of pressure and you're probably looking at about 3.6 to 4 gallons per minute is is a fairly good flow um, in a water system so if you got more than that you're going to you know you're going to jeopardize blowing the hoses out um, if you got a hissing coming from the backside somewhere then you've got a leak um, because the other way the system works is you put the hose in the gravity fill and you fill the freshwater tank and there is a little vent usually on that side that will hiss as you're filling the, the tank but then you use the water pump so if you've got a hiss coming from that city water connection if that's the inlet you're, you're talking about 
then then you've got a leak. You've got an air leak. It should be sealed better than that. Um, you know, it's either the hose is not sealing against the gasket inside. So if you're jiggling that, um, but typically you'd get a leak in there. So you know, maybe on the back side of that, I would I would have somebody take that city water fill off and maybe replace it. That's that's not a it's, typically it's not a difficult swap out. Uh, but not knowing the rig, I'm not I'm not sure exactly how it's set up. Peter asked, I have a new to me 2005 Coachman Santerra A class coach uh, with an attached propane tank, 80 pound, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how I can fill it at a seasonal park that only has drive up service. Thanks for your expertise. Mm. That's that's a difficult one because there really isn't any. Um, you know, about the only thing you can do is find a um, like a farm service. Um, because you can't take that off, and, and um, you know, if you don't want to unhook and drive to the place to go, then you're not going to be able to do it. But there are a lot of places that sell propane that have a farm service that, because that's the same thing that's going to be used out on, on a lot of the farms, either natural gas or propane. Um, but we do every year um, in, in February, we have a Buddy Holly. Richie Valens, Big Bopper, kind of a tribute. It's called the Winter Dance Party, and we bring out five or six motorhomes and use them for green rooms for the celebrities, and they run out of propane. It's We've had a couple of times where it was minus 20, so that propane just goes <laughs> And we have a local farm service that uh, comes in and fills them every day, and it's just a truck, and it drives up, and it hooks up. So uh, I would say if you're going to be at a seasonal place, there's probably somebody in the management or the, the clubhouse or even, even some of the people that are staying there. How do they fill theirs? Because you know, you know they've, they've been there a while, they probably found out who it was. Ken asks, interested in pop-up, maintenance, soft side replacement, panels, roof repair, air conditioning, fantastic fans, and awnings for truck campers. That, so the rest of you can go to sleep, because <laughs> that's going to take us a long time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the big, the biggest thing with a pop-up camper for a truck is you want to be able to inspect the the canvas in it. Um, you know, do a good thorough walk around because a lot of those sit out for a long, long time before they ever get used, and the and the roofs get dry on them and they crack, and and the canvas gets dried, and they probably don't condition it. They supposed they've got a seam sealer. At any place you got a stitching in that canvas for a window, for a zipper, anything like that. There's a seam. That needs to be sealed, and if it's not, it's going to leak. Um, you know, they're they're not an easy replacement. Um, you know, you had a lot of questions there about what would you be looking for. You know, I would first of all um, take a look at the canvas, look at getting some kind of a. There's there's canvas conditioners. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that's made for awnings would also work for the, the canvas material. Um, it, you know, the, replacing it is is not easy to do because you're talking about stitching panels, and that would. You know, I have seen some people that have taken them to an upholster shop that's familiar with tent and awning type repairs. Um, give me a couple of the other. I'm, I just want to make sure I hit more, all the points he had. He also said uh, fantastic fans and awnings, okay. uh, panels, roof repair, air conditioning. Okay. Well, and, and there's some great videos. I mean, it, it's going to take a lot of time to go through all soft those. Soft side replacement. Soft side replacement, okay. Yeah. You know, um, I, I would suggest going through the site. We have a lot of really good roof videos. We show how to clean and condition. In fact, this is probably your best product you'll get for just about anything for cleaning. Dawn dish soap, good environmentally friendly. Remember, we always talk about the ducks um, in Alaska. but. That is uh, one of the best things to clean the roof, get tar and that type of tree sap off the roof of it. Uh, look at a conditioner. There are several products. Dicor makes conditioners for EPDM or TPO. You probably have an EPDM on that. Some of them have a fiberglass top to them. Um, you know, it's, it, when it comes to repairing the roof, the best thing to do is look at either Eternabond, which is a tape. Um, you want to get all the seals to make sure that they're nice and sealed up. Uh, they, they've got a um, roof conditioner for EPDM and TPO, I think I said that before, but then the big thing they have is they have a roof uh, repair kit, not only just a patch kit, 
but they have this roll-on um, coating that if your roof is really starting to get deteriorated, you clean it really, really good, get it dry, and then just roll on this new white kind of a rubberized uh, uh, repair process, and it's a great product. Myron asked, have these pumps been known to randomly stop working? We were using our fresh water tank for a week, had done dinner dishes and started our showers. After this, we noticed that there was no water pressure in any of our taps or exterior water outlets. The light on monitor panel was on, so I assume we had power. Fuse was fine, but pump wouldn't cycle. Okay. That's not a very common problem. SureFlow and FlowJet are the two main uh, pumps that are out on the market and, and it's very simple they run on 12 volt power um, you know if the light is on then you probably have something in the pump that is, is shorting out and they, about the only thing you can really do is is you know get a simple little volt meter like this or a multimeter like that this is just a 12 volt light meter that'll light up and tell me yep I got power and find your pump and find out wh what's causing it um, does it do it is it, is it like you know something that it, it, it works fine, then it stops working? Um, you know that could possibly be uh, low batteries again that are you know are not providing enough for the pump. Pump doesn't take much, so that's usually not the case. Uh, so I would check that I would check that voltage going to it. If you do have voltage going to it and it's not working, then it's in your motor, and you know there are motors that once they once they get hot um, you know what for whatever and unfortunately Steve's not here to give me that my technical advice that I always need but um, you know the motors get hot and they they just won't work till they cool down to a certain point and the contacts you know close back up and allow it to work so got to get in there and check that motor Kevin asked what's the easiest way to replace the motor in the awning the easiest way to replace the motor in the awning is to take it to a dealer. <laughs> Unfortunately, that that's a that's a very and it depends on the awning. Um, you know, if it's A and E or Carefree, probably. I mean, the Zip D's out in the market as well. But the awning is up in the actual cylinder on the inside of it, and you have to be very very careful. Uh, these are under under high tension and. Uh, I personally didn't see it, but Steve saw one of the guys at Winnebago years ago that was trying to put these out and had a vice grips and it let go and, and ripped his hand pretty bad. I, I, I really caution people when it starts coming into the awning when you have that high tension. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos out there um, that people have attempted it, but you know it, it's a matter of um, getting it pulled out. Now, now if, if you have an A&E one, you go to the Dometic site. They have service bulletins in there that will kind of give a step-by-step -step with exploded views of doing that, but their big caution, too, is they, re they really recommend you take it to a dealership. So I, I would recommend spending some time on the Dometic site. Just look and see how comfortable you feel. Be very, very careful about that spring-loaded mechanism and making sure it's completely secure before you go any further. Jerry asked, how do I re-level the Lippert 6-point hydraulic? Uh, Lippert has a procedure for that, and, and when you say re-level, I, I would assume that you're probably saying relearn. Um, you know, be, sometimes they just get out of adjustment and, and they've got a reset uh, sequence that you go to. If you go to the Lippert system um, website, it's lc1.com and then you can go to their um, manual section and I don't know the exact procedure I'm sorry I, I, I had gone through it at one point you have to turn the system on and hit a series of buttons that makes it you know do stuff and basically pretty much relearn level and it, it's a pretty easy system to do but again find you gotta find the system that you have and um, you know go through those procedures wish I had a better answer than <laughs> go to the website but if, if I could get there right now, I would, but I don't know Brian's password. Dick asked, have issues with instrument panel, fuel gauge, tech and speedometer, work intermittently, etc. Freight liner cha chassis? Chassis. How do I find replacement instrument cluster? Ah, that's a, that's a good one because Freightliner has gone through kind of a series of, of 
changes here with uh, you know some of their distribution centers. You got to find somebody that's familiar with the uh, with the actual motorhome chassis. Um, I would say the first thing I would probably do is I would I would start with um, and it, and again it also depends on who the does it say what brand motorhome? Okay. You might want to start, what I do with a lot of people if they're looking for Freightliner stuff or um, uh, Ford stuff, I send them to a dealer. We've got like Litson's RV up in Four City. They're a big Winnebago dealer and they have really good contacts with the Freightliner parts departments around. Um, there's actually one over here in Clear Lake that they can get parts from. They have a great relationship with Pritchard Auto and and Brit that's that is kind of the Ford supplier of parts and they've got all the manuals and, and they can order through them. So you need to find a Freightliner dealer or distributor that you should be able to get these components with. Freightliner has been in business for years. They've been very vested in the in the motorhome industry. And um, you know if if you could I think if you could provide the make and model of the in the year of the R V um, you know, and, and send it in through our Facebook, through our question things, and give me a little bit of time to do some research, I can probably find it. But find a dealer that carries your brand with on the diesel stuff. Ask them, who do you guys use? You might want to try McBride RV um, out in uh, Chino, California. They're, they're, they specialize in parts. I don't know if they can get chassis parts. That's a little specific. But if you go to uh, www.rv get excuse me www.getrvparts.com um, and and just ask them how do they go about um, sourcing freightliner cluster usually it's a cluster they call it uh, parts some of those are hard to dig for steve asked dave my inverter charger has an on off switch why or when would i want to turn off my inverter what harm is there keeping it on all the time well, it, I think the on-off switch is just designed if you're going to put it um, in uh, in storage, then you have absolutely nothing that's going to backfeed the batteries or come through in it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe there's any real reason that you would turn it off if you were going to be plugged in at any time because you'd want the inverter to work and charge the batteries. So, you know, I I, I think it's just ma mainly a storage. Kind of a safety override but i will look I, I tell you what i will look into that that is a very good question um and maybe next month i can and there's a lot of different on uh, inverters there's freedom 2000 there's you know now we got the uh, progressive dynamics and others out there go power even has uh, some for there so i'll do some research and, and next next month when we go live come back and ask again hopefully i'll remember i gotta write myself a note Bob asked, what is the best source for do-it-yourself instructions on solar? I would say GoPower. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. We did a class last week on solar panels, and I contacted GoPower. Um, website. They have a section on there that says uh, why go solar. You know, they talk about the not environmentally friendly, a good backup system, economical. Um, there's just a whole host of, of reasons for going solar. There's more people that are starting to do it. They have a calculator on, on the site so you can look at it and say, okay, if I have one house battery and I'm only in and, and these appliances on a small rig I can get by with just one panel if I have two batteries and I have this size of rig chances are I've got all this other stuff and so they, they, they've got a, a um, you know a great description of of starting with the panel itself um, you know like this going through a controller you definitely want a controller because you don't want it just to constantly throw charge into your batteries um, how to place it, where to put it. It's just, it's a, it's a great site. Um, what else have I got with from there? 
Yeah, it's just, just had a, I pulled a bunch of stuff out here, and, and I'm glad you asked because I was waiting for somebody to go solar. But um, you know, it's it, it. The nice thing about solar too is it conditions your batteries. Because one of the things you're going to need to really take a look at, you could have the best solar system in in the in the world, but if your batteries are sulfated and they're only operating at about 50 percent, you're not going to be happy. Um, a lot of people b blame the solar panels. Oh, it just doesn't have enough power. Well, no, it's because that you your batteries aren't holding storage. When you're plugged in, you got this constant 13.6 volts that's going through. Even if you have your batteries are dead, they're gonna they're gonna go through and provide that power. While you're out there trying to charge these batteries up and hold them with the solar panel, and and if the batteries are sulfated, it's not gonna work. So, I would say go to gpelectric.com, go power, look at their site. Um, ph phenomenal product. We 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 were very impressed with it. Really easy to install. We put it up on the roof, we ran the cable down through the refrigerator vent, and we put the controller right under the refrigerator vent. And luckily for us, uh, you have two options. You, you, you can either hook it to the converter uh, that, w that goes to the battery, or you can hook it to the battery direct. And our batteries were kind of a ways away from where we could come down easily, but our converter was right next to the refrigerator um, underneath the drawer. So we came down to the back of the refrigerator, put the controller underneath the refrigerator right next to the LP leak detector, hooked to the converter side that went to the batteries, and it was very easy. Warren asked, when attempting to run the air conditioning on parallel 4,000 total generators, the air conditioning will turn on, load down the generators, I can hear the air conditioning fans working, but no cold air. Okay. A few minutes later, the generators load down some more. For a few minutes, the air comes out cold, but the generators overload and shuts off the load. No other systems are running in the RV at this time. Is there something wrong with my AC? Um, yeah, the first thing I would recommend is to, is to get up and check your evaporator cool coils and your condenser coils. The way the system works is you've got re return air from inside the rig is going to come up inside the return air vent and it's going to, the, the blower motor kicks in and it's drawing that air in and it's going to go over these evaporator coils and it's going to draw the moisture out and it's going to um, cool that air and then it's going to come through and it's going to dump it. You've got a squirrel cage on this side that's pulling the air through and dumping it down here. If my evaporator coils are dirty it's going to block that airflow. It's going to drag that system down, and and your startup capacitors are going to pull. The amp draw is going to go crazy. Uh, last couple of weeks ago, we did a class on this, and we showed putting a towel over the condenser coils on the back side. Same thing. If I've got a whole bunch of debris, if I got the fins are all kind of flattened out, I'm not getting good airflow coming into that. So it. it blocks that airflow, everything works harder, and it's not going to cool as efficient. And, then, and so probably what's happening is you've got the hot air as you first start in, hot moist air as you start it up, and it's working harder and harder, and that moisture can't get through. Um, they make a condenser and a um, evaporator cleaning agent. I, I wouldn't recommend doing the Dawn on that stuff. Um, you want a little bit um, more sensitive. Um, piece, but they, they show a way to do it. And when you clean the evaporator coils, you're going to have to do that from the top, but you're, you're going to make sure that you put something around that drip pan because right there you've got that return air vent and you don't want water getting inside your coach. So put some plastic down underneath that. And uh, we had one unit that came out of a lady's rig that we showed a sample of it. You opened it up, that evaporator is completely coated with talcum powder. This lady would put talcum powder and right in, in the living room area, right where the f fresh air or the uh, air return was at, and pff, it just completely filled it. Pet hair, dust, anything like that. Get that stuff clean, and uh, then and then also if the if the coils are flattened, you'll need to get a comb, and they make a comb especially for those that you can just run and straighten all those all those coils out with with that comb. So. I, I would say it's your airflow, and if you have ducted roof air, make sure all those are open. You know, don't don't close off some just so you can get one little 
spot in the living room because it needs that airflow. And again, you're going to get that high amp draw. Beverly asked, I am looking to find the flexible tubing, I think it's five and a fourth, blue and white tubing. Do they still make it? And if not, what can I use instead? Or would it be 51 over four? I'm not sure. So five and a fourth. Flexible inch. blue tubing. Flexible tubing, blue and white tubing. Blue and white. And I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, um, you know, if, like five and a quarter inches in diameter. That's about you know what this is, and uh, blue and white. I'm not sure exactly what that's used for. There's some tubing that's used for heaters um, that that go underneath from the heater, underneath cabinets, underneath the sofa to the registers. There's um, it says flexible tubing. Well, that's yeah, and that that's kind of a corrugated flexible that would go underneath it. But usually that was silver. It was kind of an insulated tubing. I, I I'm not familiar with what the blue tubing is um, and, and and what it comes from I guess if, if you could send in um, you know a Facebook question or one of our other social medias or if, if we can get another one back in here before and I'm sure we got quite a line of questions so I'm unfortunately I'm not sure exactly what tubing you're talking about but you should be able to get a retrofit whatever it is there are manufacturers out there right now the industry is just flying and there are a lot of companies building just about anything you need. I can make one on a 3D printer too, I'm pretty sure. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Lewis asked, I just inherited a 1986 Gulfstream Sun Sport and took it for a drive and it will not climb hills. When they were new, were there any issues with their power? Um, they were, no, not really. It, and it was an 86, is that right? Yes. Okay, so it's more than likely on a Chevy chassis, the old P30 chassis you had a 454 engine in that with a carbureted they didn't come out until 1989 or 90 with the uh, fuel injected engines and overdrive transmission it was sluggish um, did it say what size it was it just says a 1986 Gulf Stream Sun Sport okay and, and if it was the bigger unit then then yeah there were some power issues um, you know I remember going up uh, hills uh, I first started traveling the country with the 1988, uh, I believe it was, um, Winnebago. And I'm, if you hit a 6% grade, there's a really good test from up going up to Bakersfield in California, the Eisenhower Tunnel. Uh, I remember going down to about 25 to 30 miles an hour in some of those, but those were 36, 38-foot uh, motorhomes. Um, you know, if you have an exhaust leak, some of those older coaches are... Uh, fairly notorious for having an exhaust manifold leak, so you're gonna you're gonna have that tick 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 sound of air escaping out of there. That's gonna drive your power down. Um, you had a lot of companies that would come in and put, or a lot of owners would come in and put a bank system in that, or um, there's there's some other performance enhancement systems, and some of them put. Uh, there was a transmission gear vendors was one that a lot of them had a different gearing system in the transmission or rear ends or places so there's there's some things you can do but it it's you know it's not going to perform like your truck leslie asked i noticed that when i dump my black tank the odor fills up my rig and doesn't go away but lessens over time i perform tank flushings deodorizing tablets and liquids but nothing seems to get rid of the odor completely as a new full-time is this normal versus manually pulling tanks, or should I get a professional cleaning, and or can you suggest an alternative? Should I only use the Sanicon? Thank you. Well, um, the first thing you want to make sure is, you know, you shouldn't get odors inside the rig when you dump the black water tank. Um, you know, that, that should be a completely sealed system, so you got to check your toilet, your vents up on the top, make sure that, you know, they're, they're not plugged. A lot of times what happens, you might have a cheater vent uh, in it. And what a cheater vent is, is that you need from your tank that's underneath your rig here, you need a vent that goes up, usually up to the top, and it's got a little cap on the top of it, and it allows air to come in so you don't create a vacuum, and they draw that out. Now, there are some manufacturers where their vent comes up right into a spot where there's a cabinet. So it can't go through the cabinet because it's wide open. So they, they stop it underneath here, and you'll see this pipe that comes up and there's a little cap on the pipe we call those cheater vents 
and basically what it's designed to do is to help draw air in, but those go bad and they let odors out. So when you dump your tank, you're getting a lot of movement and stuff. Um, you know, check that, check that vent and the one up on the top. Uh, make sure all your fans are off inside your rig anytime you're doing any of that because if you've got an exhaust fan on, it's going to pull anything and it's going to create that pr pressure pulling stuff up. Um, I would also check your, your seal on your toilet just to make sure that you've got a good solid spade going back with the, with the rubber gasket holding it. So that's where you're going to get the most of your, of your odors coming up in. So you know, that's the first step I would do. The second step I would do is I would have it um, add a black water flush valve in it. That's where you can you drill a hole in the side, you put this valve in, you hook up city water with pressure up, and it just, it just cleans the whole thing out. Um, I, I would take bleach and, for, well, there's a product called Tank Blaster from Thetford that is a good tank cleaner. Um, I got one in the other room. I don't have it here, but uh, uh, don't worry about it. It's just, it's a, it's a bag called Tank Cleaner, Tank Blaster is what it is. It's from Thetford. Um, try using that to clean things in it. The other thing you want to do is a lot of people don't use the proper chemical inside. You want to use a chemical that has what we call the good bugs. It's, it does an, anaer um, an aerobic um, digestion of the sewage in there. It, you know, if you, if you ever do a, a plant tour of a sewage plant, if you have the unfortunate task of doing that, anyway, um, they use and aerobic bugs or micro, um, bacteria to digest all the sewage. A lot of people will throw um, pine salt down or you know other stuff that's that's not made to do it that way. That's when you get that rotten egg smell. That's when you get the really horrible odors. Go to Thetford and get their tank chemical that's designed to do it the right way, and that should really reduce those odors as well. But then and then you can get it cleaned. Pat asked, I have a leak on the pipe going into the black water holding. What kind of black putty or glue do you use to seal that black pipe? No one knows. Um, most of that stuff, is, it's all PVC based. Um, you know, you got the primer first and then the PVC glue that goes into it. So there's, there's not a really good sealer aftermarket, or I should say aftermarket outside of the fact of that. Now I have seen some people that have come in with uh, Eternabond, uh, even Flex Seal. Uh, a lot of people have, have, you know, if you get, it's got to be perfectly dry, but I have seen where some people have gone in with uh, Eternabond tape or the Flex Seal spray. Flex Seal even makes a tape uh, that you can put on there as well. But, you know, the, if it's leaking, typically the, the only fix that is really permanent on something like that is to take it out, clean it, get a new valve and new pipe and just use the PVC primer first. Um, you know, the old white stuff was the purple, but I think with the black it's a clear primer cleaner and then the, the PVC stuff. But if you can't take it apart, make sure you get it really clean, really dry. Um, look, at, look, at, uh, look at some of that flex, steel stuff, or flex seal stuff. Bill asked, our power steering started making groaning sounds. Check fluid level and it was a bit low. Topped off, topped up and although groany is less, still present. Where is power steering pump? It pumps usually right underneath the reservoir. Um, it, I guess without the make and model and the year again, it's, it's hard to tell, but usually wherever you're Wherever your reservoir is at, that pump is, is very close to that because they don't want a lot of line going through it. Um, and if it's grinding, you should be able to, that the pump is what's grinding. Uh, it's not the reservoir. So check, check right underneath it, and I would say that your, your power steering pump is starting to go out. If, it, if it's grinding like that, even with the reservoir at a good level, you know, a lot of times the reservoir will be right up on the firewall, but the pump will be very close to it. You should see exactly where it goes to. Last question because of time. Okay. Gary asked, I have, oops, sorry. Yes, okay, sorry. Gary asked, I have two six volt batteries which run lights, water pump, vents, and heater fan, etc. They work very well and last overnight. I thought I had at least one plug that I could use for 
120 appliances such as a fan or charge phones, iPad, etc. None work without being hooked to shore power or generator. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much the case. Your two 12-volt batteries or 6-volt batteries are going to be hooked in series, meaning positive to negative to give you a 12-volt bank. That typically is not enough power to go through an inverter. The only way you can get anything to work off your batteries is to get an inverter. The smaller little 100-watt ones will, will do a TV VCR, DVD player VCR. I just dated myself there. Um, it, it, then, but some of them have the bigger 2,000 watt, which will which will do refrigerators. Um, some of them will do outlets, but very few of them will do hardly any outlets in there. So if if you want to, you know, get one of your outlets to to work that way, uh, I would say get a small, just a 100 watt inverter that allows you to plug in and charge your bat, charge your phone or something like that. You know, that's typically they're not going to be into that outlet system because all those are hooked with Romex, the, the 120 volt cable, three, three cord or three wire cable into the distribution center. So best thing is just get a portable. One of the little portables that you can get at any home improvement store, Best Buys, Walmarts, just about anywhere. Pretty inexpensive too. So I guess we're probably out of time. 8.01 I guess it is. So I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I'm glad you, you joined us. We had some great questions. Uh, you know, I I, uh, every time I, I do this, and you know, I've been in the business since 1983, and it's amazing how many things pop up with these questions. I go, really? I didn't know that. There's so many variables, there's so many different models, uh, so, you know, and a lot of fun. So keep asking the questions, keep going to the site, keep sending the questions, and uh, we'll keep helping you out. And then have a great what's left of the summer. Enjoy your uh, Labor Day weekend coming up here and uh, get whatever is left of the summer uh, for camping. Take care. Thank you. And then we sit with that awkward pause, and I say, so I, I should sing Happy Trails or something, shouldn't yeah. I? Happy Trails.